Uh, what I'm going to ask everybody to do is to uh, uh, mute the microphones if they're not speaking. I think that's probably the best thing to do. Um, also, it's probably a good idea if you um, keep your cameras off just whilst you're not speaking as well, just so that the, the bandwidth works better for a, a webinar like this. So welcome to this webinar. Anyway, um, my name's Jane Lynch. I'm a training program director with the National School of Healthcare Science. Um, and we've got a webinar this afternoon, which is the second in a series to introduce you to two new programmes that we've got. And these are a graduate diploma in respiratory science and a postgraduate certificate in sleep medicine. So on the, um, the webinar this afternoon, we've got representatives from the two universities that are going to provide it, be providing the academic course uh, for those. So they're going to talk to you. And also we have um, uh, our commissioning colleagues here to talk about the funding and um, how to get um, an application in for the programme. Um, the first university that we've got to speak today is Sheffield Hallam University. They're going to be, be providing the teaching for the 2023 cohort for the graduate diploma. They'll be offering around about 25 places for the first year. The University of the West of England are also here. They will be providing the postgraduate certificate in sleep medicine in 2023. And we're hoping that they'll also be able to provide some uh, uh, some teaching for the graduate diploma in 2024 so that we can increase the number of places on that one. Um, there's going to be an opportunity for questions between speakers. So each time a speaker has um, given a presentation, we will open up a Q&A session. The best way for us to get your questions for that is to pop them in the Q&A tab. And then Katie Foster, one of my colleagues, is going to um, collate those and read them out. So we'll get some answers in between each section and then we'll have another uh, question and answer session at the end if there's anything that we still need to um, talk about. The webinar also is going to be recorded, so it's going to be available on the school website as soon as possible. So right now I'm going to hand over to Anne-Marie Harrison, who's going to be um, talking on behalf of Sheffield Hallam University. OK, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me. OK, I'm just going to share my screen. And I've got a few slides that will, I hope, sort of help us to um, sort of be clear on what I'm what I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon. So first of all, yes, thank you to Jane. Um, and firstly to say that um, we're very, very pleased to be able to give them to have the opportunity to run this programme. Um, we've been running the degree apprenticeship in healthcare science, cardiovascular, respiratory and sleep sciences for a number of years. Um, and it's great to sort of see this programme come on board to help address the growing need for um, respiratory and sleep physiologists in the sort of current world that we find ourselves in, uh, sort of post pandemic. So I'm Anne Marie Harrison. I am currently the course leader for our uh, BSc Healthcare Science, Cardiovascular, Respiratory and Sleep um, Sciences Apprenticeship. So I'm going to just give a, a brief overview to, to who we are. Um, some of you sort of may already um, sort of know Sheffield Hallam University, you may be familiar with the apprenticeship. Um, sort of through having apprentices on there, but I'm going to sort of talk through what we plan to deliver for the graduate diploma as well. So I'm representing the Department of Biosciences and Chemistry, and we are part of a very large college, which is the College of Health, Wellbeing and Life Sciences. Um, as the name suggests from that, we run um, a very large number of health related courses and um, got very large nursing and midwifery cohorts um, and also a number of the allied health professions. So we, within the college, we have a strong and quite long track record of working with the NHS and um, working on, on this kind of course as well. Within our own department of biosciences and chemistry, we've been running the BSc Biomedical Science for many years now, a number of decades, and that's our largest undergraduate course. And again, through that, and I previously had involvement in that, um, we liaised and worked quite closely with uh, not just local hospitals, but hospitals around the country with students on sandwich placement and also working with students who are taking the course part time whilst employed in those hospitals. And we also have been very actively involved in the re most recent trailblazer groups, both for healthcare science and life sciences. So, as I've said, um, we've been running the degree apprenticeship in cardiovascular, respiratory and sleep sciences since September 2017. So we've actually had three cohorts graduate successfully from that programme, which is around 60 students during that time and we currently obviously have three years on programme at the moment with sort of cohort sizes of 
sort of between 18 and 25 on each year of that course. And that course is following the practitioner training programme PTP curriculum as sort of defined by the National School of Healthcare Science. And what we plan to do for the graduate diploma is obviously use um, our existing material um, modules and sort of teaching expertise and experience of, of working with workplaces from the apprenticeship in healthcare science. Um, so the requirements of the graduate diploma obviously pull material from that existing PTP programme. Um, and I will talk through how we plan to do that over the next few slides and the next few minutes as well. Um, one of the things that I think is really important in this programme um, is that there is there is a there's quite a, a big workload both for the um, student and for the workplaces supporting them as as well as perhaps us as the provider. Um, so I think it's really important that we have very robust support and monitoring processes. Um, sort of for, for all involved in the process and and the apprenticeship also requires that so we do have experience of of this sort of monitoring and support that's required for the apprenticeship and we intend to sort of um work from those processes to help support and monitor this program as well um we also have um some very well established um, assessment tools that we use for the apprenticeship. And I think the particularly important one here is how we're evidencing um, the clinical competencies, the workplace competencies, and also the professional practice strand of the diploma. And we have a very well um, established pebble pad portfolio um, tool, which we've used to use this for, do this for the apprenticeship, which is what we'll continue to do um, for this program. And we, we kind of quality assure access to that Pebble Pack portfolio. So a designated workplace supervisor has access to that and sort of takes responsibility for signing off um, sort of elements of the student's progress. And um, so my next um, slide, if I can move on. Just a couple of screenshots there. I'm not quite sure how, how large these are appearing on your screen, but just to highlight here. So at the, in the top left um, image, um, it's just I will just put this on to show um, the, the way that that portfolio is separated. It's one portfolio that covers the professional practice strands. So I don't know if you can just make out professional practice three in the top left and also has tabs for completion of the various clinical competencies. So this is a, an example from a final year uh, portfolio. I've just expanded one of the menus there for some of the respiratory testing in that um, as part of the requirements there. The second image is just to show um, how we um, sort of monitor progress. So this is a checklist for the, the workplace supervisor in conjunction with the student to monitor the progress through the professional practice learning outcomes. And it's simply done on a almost a traffic light system. We've got um, um, yet has yet to start on that particular topic is ongoing. Um, or has already completed and submitted that topic. And obviously by the end of the portfolio, we want that to be fully complete. Um, so I'll come back to the, the support and a bit more detail on that in a, in a few moments time. Um, so the course modules for the graduate diploma. So the graduate diploma is 120 credits at level six at final year level. Um, as you can see from what's on the slide now, we've actually got um, 140 credits because one of the requirements for the graduate diploma is the instrumentation, signal processing and imaging module, which is a 20 credit um, second year module from our existing apprenticeship. So we intend for these students to take that module um, in the same way that the apprentices take that module. So there would be no change um, in that module for this cohort. They will simply drop in to the module that currently exists. Um, the other modules, the level six modules, as you can see, there are three 40 credit modules there. Um, so you've got professional practice for respiratory and sleep physiologists, which is a new module specifically for this program, um, but is very much based on the professional practice strand that runs through all three years of the healthcare science um, apprenticeship that, that we currently have. Um, respiratory and sleep physiology, again, a new module for this program, but this will be based on the sort of 
sort of scientific sort of underpinning underpinning um sort of pathologies for some respiratory conditions uh, the more technical content such as things like um methods for assessing lung function and principles behind those methods sort of quality assurance um calibration etc so that the theory behind um sort of respiratory conditions and measurements and and this is drawn from our existing modules at both lev both levels five and six on the apprenticeship. And the final module is the respiratory work based training module, which again is a new module for this programme. But this is now pulling out more specifically the clinical competency modules. Um, so in, on, on the apprenticeship, we combine some of the theory with the competency in our modules for the purposes of this programme. We've separated out sort of more theoretical um sort of technical sort of knowledge side of things and had the work-based training module very specifically um just assessment of the clinical competencies and and, and the dops and case-based discussions that go along with that okay so as as is clear i think from from that description obviously some of the teaching and, and the material covered is common to the healthcare science apprenticeship and there will be some overlap of teaching of this graduate diploma cohort with the apprentices um, for, for some of that certainly for the clinical work and professional practice and they will also have some separate short blocks where it will just be this cohort um, just covering material that's more specific to them and, and those particularly will be the first induction block on the course and the final block because the, the requirements at the end of, of this programme are quite different to those of the apprenticeship with the um, endpoint assessment. So the next slide actually perhaps gives a little bit more detail on this. So I'm actually going to sort of start from this. So through spring and summer 2023, we'll be looking at applicants for the course um, and enrolment of those applicants onto the course and hopefully have achieved that by early September 2023. So during that time, we'll be enrolling the, the students. We would also be running a training the trainers session for identified workplace supervisors and similarly run an online session for the students. So our first block week will not run block attendance would be in October, but we would be looking to have an online meeting with the students to kind of get them um, familiar with the um, learning environment blackboard, which we use and also any sort of preliminary requirements to help prepare them for that first time that they'll attend with us in Sheffield. Um, and what we would also want to do quite early on in the process, whether that's before the first block week or um, very soon afterwards, be to have um, meetings between sort of an allocated member of the course team and each individual student and their designated supervisor, just to make sure that we're quite familiar with kind of where everybody is, what their experience is, where they're coming from, and making sure that people have got a training plan in place. So, so basically, we'll run first block in October 2023, and that will be just these students. This will be separate from an apprenticeship block, and this will be just a couple of days. Each block will be just a couple of days, um, which will be induction to the university and introductions to all of the modules that I've just described. So um, all of the four modules will be started in that first block week. Uh, block block attendance, there won't be weeks. Um, we will provide distance learning material for the students to engage with between blocks. And then we'll have second block and the third block in December 23 and March 24 will be um, attended concurrently with the apprentices. And what would happen on those weeks is that on the, the day that clinical and professional practice teaching takes place, they will be with the final year apprentices and they will have another day that is specific to this cohort to cover um, the other requirements that obviously are not being covered with the level six apprentices. Um, by the time we get to block four in May 2024, this group will have completed two of those modules, which is sort of indicated just by the scale of the boxes on the image there. So instrumentation, signal processing and imaging and the respiratory and sleep physiology will both be completed in the standard academic year. So by um, end of April, those modules will be complete, but these students will be continuing on with their professional practice and their respiratory work based training 
um, in the workplace. And so that final block in May 2024 will will be just this cohort again to kind of deal with the specific um, areas that are still ongoing for them. Um, so as, as I've mentioned, we've been running this apprenticeship for a number of years now, so we have quite an experienced um, team of both academic staff from Sheffield Hallam and also um, the clinical practitioners who we tend to refer to as the clinical team. Um, so, so we have um, this team of associate lecturers who are very experienced in sort of liaising with the workplace and the students in the workplace. Um, the work-based training will be based on the existing portfolio that we use for the apprenticeship because it's essentially the same as the practitioner training programme, which is required for both of these courses. Um, each of the um, students on the course will be allocated a specific clinical tutor from the SHU clinical team. And there's also the um, academic team, as I've mentioned as well. So we've got um, sort of a number of dedicated individuals there as a as sort of small team of of people to support this group who, who have experience of a very similar um, sort of course delivery. Um, but just to elaborate on that, just for a couple more minutes, um, I think one of the things that's that I mentioned earlier is, is that there is quite a lot of work uh, within this programme to complete within the, the, the year that's um, required. So I think it's important there that we make sure that both students and workplaces are very well supported in making sure we've got a training plan in place very early on and that we keep up to date on progress and, and anything that might occur to um, slow progress down. Um, in for, for any reason at all. So again, utilising support mechanisms that we've very well established within the department. So each of the learners on the course will be allocated an academic advisor who is a member of the um, Hallam academic course team and a clinical tutor. Um, and they will monitor progress, whether it be through the more um, sort of theoretical academic modules and also um, monitor the progress with the clinical work and the professional practice work, they will both be a sort of a point of contact with the workplace. And I think it's important to make to sort of emphasise that that there's massive support for the workplace as well here, as well as providing pastoral support. Um, and they will carry out an initial re review of the skills and knowledge that these learners are coming in with. Um, al although all of the learners on this programme will have a degree, and there is quite a range of different degrees that they may have come from, and, and with that, a range of different backgrounds and work experience that they may have. And, and I think it'll be important to sort of make sure that we're very familiar with that and sort of have identified where any particular learning needs um, might be, any areas that any particular learner might find more challenging or areas they might find a little bit easier. Um, in line with our apprenticeship, we would instigate monthly progress meetings um, with, between the learner and the workplace supervisor, and this would be reported back to the course leader um, via the electronic portfolio. And, and we'd maintain a very much an open door, open email box policy uh, wherever there, there are any issues that, that we need to deal with um, as soon as possible and maybe report back to the um, to the national school if necessary as well. Um, and, and we have regular course team meetings um, where we would discuss and confirm progress of all learners and again identify any concerns and escalate as necessary if we needed to. Um, um, as well as as well as those things, all, all the learners on the course will have full access to all of the support mechanisms that are available at the university for all students. Um, so the, the Hallam Help is just our sort of generic student support system providing both academic advice and um, pastoral support. They would have access to the learning centre, which is obviously much of which is available online and open 24 seven for the times that these students would be on campus with us here in Sheffield. Um, we hold employer support sessions for the apprenticeship twice per semester, in addition to the training, the trainer sessions at the start of the year, and I would um, expect to continue to do that as a separate session for the um, employers of this group of students as well, because it, it would likely raise a different, whilst there might be some common questions, um, this is a slightly different group in terms of how we monitor them as well. And we monitor attendance at sessions for the apprenticeship and we would incorporate that here as well, just so that we, we can make sure that everybody's attending as they should. Um, so I said important for the workplace to be supported as well. Um, so we have a 
a pre-course training, the trainer session. This will happen in September and these twice semesterly catch up sessions to give to up update that group for us to discuss any general issues and provide support on pebble pad or any other just general questions. Um, and as I've mentioned, we allocate both a clinical and academic tutor for each student so that they are equally a point of contact for the workplace as well. And this seems to work very well on the apprenticeship. So we're hoping that a lot of the good practice we have there and um, will carry over into this programme as well. Um, so just um, a sort of quick timeline of kind of where we are at, at the moment. Obviously, we're going through um, a, an approval process at the moment, um, sort of liaising with, with the National School of Healthcare Science. And I believe some of my colleagues later in the meeting will talk a little bit more about um, sort of recruitment, etc. Um, but by August, September later this year, we will have set up the course. Um, so Blackboard sites will exist, we'll have the learners enrolled and, as I said, have um, sessions with those to make sure that they're fully prepared for when they meet us on campus in October and as well as running the um, sort of training the trainers, which I've mentioned. So first of all, we, we've proposed this to be the week beginning the 11th of October. It'll be the Monday and Tuesday of that week, probably. Um, then start all of the modules, be set assessments, hopefully start work on their portfolio. So a big chunk of that session will be making sure that every student is familiar with how they work with PebblePad. Um, second block week in December um, with the apprenticeship students and also put a workplace visit on here. Um, obviously, this may be an online visit. Um, depending on what's most appropriate. If a site visit is necessary, obviously that can be arranged as well. Um, then we move into um, the new year, into January 2024. Um, we have a, a block in March and a block in May. March with the apprentices, May just with this cohort. And again, a second workplace visit, either online or, um, the, or, or in person if necessary. So by the end of that standard um, academic year, say two modules will be completed, so that will be 60 credits worth of completion. The, the professional practice and clinical um, competence portfolio work, we anticipate to continue through to July of 2024, which would allow completion of, of those modules, assessment of that work, which would allow us to take the, the students to an exam board um, in in September time to make sure that they are fully sort of completed and have graduated within a year of, of starting the course um, for, for, for this group. And, and then obviously we, we sort of start again for 24, 25 and 25, 26. Um, it's important that we make sure we get feedback on how, we, how we're doing on the course. And I know this is something that we will be reporting back to the, to the school as well. Um, and we, we very much welcome feedback. So with various mechanisms for getting student feedback, we will try to get student representatives from this um, group, which is what con contributes to the student voice process at the university. And students also fill in module evaluation forms. And we would have hopefully regular employer feedback, either via the training, the trainers um, sessions, the twice semesterly meetings, and also the review process, as, as well as having pretty much, like I said, an, an open door um, for any comments and suggestions and that will allow us sort of during the running of the course uh, during the running of the year to identify if there are any issues and take appropriate action and allow us to feedback and, and then at, at the end of modules and at the end of the year we'd have um, the involvement of the internal moderators for the modules and external examiner and obviously feedback any comments and, and points that they had noted in their review of the modules and their assessment. Um, so just, I'm going to finish there. So just to summarise, we're looking at um, a block attendance of a couple of days in the week spread over four occasions, some of which is um, together with the apprenticeship cohort, some of which is individual to this group. Um, and we've got experienced clinical tutor support for the student and the workplace. I think that's an important point to emphasise, very experienced with delivering this curriculum. So I, I hope that everyone sort of here feels that they would be supported in what's a new programme and quite a big workload and, and that goes along with um, the student support and monitoring as well to sort of make sure we can um, ensure success on the programme for these um, students who are coming into this um, with their different qualifications. So 
I'll finish there. So any questions, anybody? Can I, if I um, come out of here and I can stop sharing? Um, so we've had a question for you, Amber, from Nicola. Um, so as a summary, over the academic year, how many days do the students need to be released from the host department to attend face to face teaching at Sheffield? OK, um, we are looking at two, eight days. So uh, where I've referred to the block times, that would be two days a week. Um, so eight days. Brilliant. Um, and we've had a question from Gavin. Um, is there any guidance on which degrees will allow entry onto the course? Um, th there is, yes. Um, I do have something with me, actually. That's the uh, specification. So, so this, this is the documentation produced by the by um, from Health Education England, but I'm just OK to read from this. So we've we've got phys physiology based degrees, um, so biology or human biology. Um, biomedical science, um, sports science that has significant science content, um, other healthcare degrees, which could include nursing, radiography, physiotherapy, paramedic, um, forensic science, um, and any other degree with a, a significantly relevant science content, content where we're looking particularly at anatomy and physiology um, for, for this. If, um, so I, I believe one of my colleagues at, at this meeting later on will talk a little bit more about recruitment because I think recruitment will not be done by the individual universities. Um, but th those are the kind of things we're looking at, if that helps. Thank you. Um, we've had another question from Shelley. Um, presumably the students need 20% off the job type like other apprenticeships. Um, it's not an apprenticeship. Um, so I don't think that requirement is, is I think what these students will need is appropriate um, time to complete their um, the, the required competencies and obviously the professional practice work that would be done as the work based learning. Um, but these are not apprentices, so they're not covered by the apprenticeship funding rules, which is where that off the job requirement comes from. And um, again, I'm not sure if someone later on in this session will talk a little bit more about um, some of that and, and um, sort of what, what might be covered uh, but but we would we would be working with the employer to sort of um sort of formulate a kind of training plan and and look at what's required um, here. but I, but uh, to, to generalize i think we would be looking at a, around a 20 percent off the job time at least to um for, for successful completion of what's required here um yeah so so i think as a as a ballpark thing i, th I think that's a reasonably close approximation but we're not bound by the same rules in that sense um, we'll do one last question for you, Anne-Marie, and then we'll okay. move over to UE. Um, so is this course only available for current NHS staff or can anyone apply? OK, I'm right. I think I might have to. Can I? I think that might be addressed later in the presentation. I don't know if one of my other colleagues can um, can say that. I mean, from a from a Hallam perspective, obviously, um, the to complete the course, a, a learner is going to have to be an employment. Um, but whether it's an existing employee that you have that has one of those qualifying degrees or whether it's someone you would be planning to employ um, specifically to take this programme, uh, I think from, a, from a, a university point of view, we're happy with either of those things. And for, for, for the apprenticeship, we've had uh, very much both of those things. We have a real mix, um, which I think is, is important that we, we're very much aware of that people's backgrounds and experience is very different. Um, so, 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 yeah, it could be it could be either. It could be, you know, an existing as long as they meet that um, required degree qualification, um, then then, yes, we would we would be happy to take them on. I think Helen has a hand up. I think Helen might be able to answer more. Yes, I think for this year we will discuss uh, the expressions of interest portal later, but we are looking at people who are already employed because the way we will do the expressions of interest is that we'll ask for employers to put in their expressions of interest. This is partly because it's already really late in the year, so we're going to trial it this year and perhaps review it for the future. Lovely. Thank you both very much. Um, we're going to pass over to the UE team now. So if they just want to start um, coming onto the screen and sharing their slides, that'd be great. Um, and just a reminder, if you 
have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A tab. Um, there's a couple in the chat that we'll try and come back to uh, when we do questions for all presenters later. But if you could pop any questions into the Q&A tab, it, it's just easier to keep track of them. Um, and there's a couple of people who aren't able to see slides, uh, but apparently if you minimise your screen and then maximise your screen again, that should work. Um, but the webinar is recorded and will be shared online afterwards um, if you if you miss any of the slides. Um, Adrian, I'd like to hand over to you then. Thank you. OK, um, do I control the slides or are you in control? You can tell me when you want me to go forward and I will do it. <laughs> OK, fine. So um, thank you. Uh, I'm Adrian Kendrick. Um, I'm senior lecturer at uh, UWE and also a consultant clinical scientist in sleep and home ventilation at University Hospitals Bristol. Um, so welcome to UE. Next slide, please. Uh, so UE, uh, this just shows some images, images of uh, the university. It's a, a large ca open campus university. It's a very dynamic university. Um, has a very uh, broad cultural background. It's very diverse uh, student and staff groups as well, uh, and has been delivering the um, apprenticeship courses, uh, I think, from about 2011. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these are the courses we currently um, provide um, in terms of the apprenticeship scheme. Um, and as I say, we've been doing the respiratory and sleep one from about 2011 onwards. And we've added the other courses um, that you can see on this screen. So we have uh, a very strong experience in delivering to healthcare uh, science uh, groups. Uh, we work closely with employers uh, and we um, ensure that as far as is reasonably practicable, um, we uh, support uh, the students and are getting uh, what the students want and what the employers want ultimately. Uh, next slide, please. So the process that we've put into place for those apprenticeship courses, we will apply also to this course as well. Um, so we uh, will be providing the course in terms of on-campus block weeks, which I'll come back to uh, uh, later on. Uh, in between those block weeks, we will be having online teaching sessions uh, via um, the uh, online platform that we will be using uh, from October onwards. Uh, and these will take place at preset times uh, throughout the week and they will be pre-planned well in advance. There will also be provision of interactive online learning resources so that lectures will be recorded and some uh, may indeed be pre-recorded and then uh, can act as a tutorial session for some of the online um, teaching sessions that we will be providing. Uh, we will be doing assessments as required by the course uh, and these will be put in various uh, points throughout the course so that we can ensure that the um, students are progressing. Central to all of uh, the academic provision is uh, the student support. Uh, we have extensive experience of, of providing support, not only into, from the academic staff, but also from our, uh, excellent student support services uh, that will deal with problems that students have. And you know, we accept that all human beings occasionally go through bad phases. Um, we, we are very strong on supporting those students as much as we can and providing them both academically and non-academic support as required. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So the background to the PG Cert, uh, the curriculum development team is uh, shown up above. I was uh, one of the curriculum co-writers along with Megan Crawford and uh, Sarah Parsons, Shruti Konda and Tim Quinnell. Uh, and we were um, excellently managed by Crystal Fisher who made sure we did everything that we were supposed to do. Thank you, Crystal. Um, why do we need this? Well, sleep is an area which is rapidly developing, particularly in sleep breathing disorders, but there are around about 80 sleep disorders that we recognise both in adults and paediatrics. This course, of course, is just for adults. So trying to get staff who have got specific experience just in sleep is actually quite difficult. 
uh, and there's no current sleep only qualifications that exist. So we pull into sleep laboratories uh, of a of wide variety of uh, different backgrounds. Um, we try to train them in house. And obviously there is the apprenticeship scheme uh, and the respiratory science course, but that is respiratory plus sleep. And what this is about is not forgetting the respiratory bit, but very much focusing on the developing the practitioner in sleep medicine. Um, the staff uh, who will be um, uh, on this course will be um, will have a relevant degree, so they'll be appointed uh, to uh, their departments because there will be a lot of uh, in-house work that they'll have to do along with the academic content that will be provided. Uh, and we will be, uh, we advise employers uh, to look at where they can do not only the respiratory uh, sleep disorders, but also how they can develop their skills in the non-respiratory sleep disorders, which is the other big module in this group. And there are four modules uh, that you can see there. Uh, so we're going to look at the clinical assessment, so basically taking a history. And although there are overlaps between the history of respiratory and non-respiratory sleep disorders, there are some subtle differences. The investigations can be similar across both of them. Ultimately, uh, polysomnography, uh, where we're looking at sleep uh, and breathing and uh, um, leg movements and videoing these, these are done standard in most uh, major sleep centers. And then there's the two big modules, which are the respiratory sleep disorders, primarily obstructive sleep apnea, but also the non-respiratory sleep disorders, which will include things like insomnia, narcolepsy, idiopathic hypersomnolence, etc. Uh, next slide. So I'm just going to run through briefly. A lot of this is similar. These are the clinical, these are the outcomes uh, uh, that have been put into each of the, the modules. And this is the clinical assessment one. So it's taking good history from patients with suspected respiratory and non-respiratory sleep disorders. And then trying to put this into uh, context as to what investigations are relevant uh, to understanding what is going on so that we get the appropriate data to then make clinical decisions. And it is also very much taking a patient-centered approach uh, to practice. Uh, we need to, to communicate with the patient and learning those skills and teasing out the relevant information from uh, people to understand what their sleep problem is, is perhaps somewhat more complex than uh, some other aspects of clinical practice. They also need to be able to interpret the results and hence formulate management plans based on the results and also importantly, patient choice. And communication is essential. And one of the problems, regardless of whether it's respiratory or non-respiratory sleep disorders, is that we have to have an understanding of the very clear guidance provided by the DVLA and other licensable occupations such as air traffic controllers, airline pilots, um, and um, train drivers. Uh, next slide. So this is the investigations, um, and this will cover very basic investigations such as overnight pulse oximetry, all the way through to um, actigraphy plus polysomnography plus um, assessment of daytime sleepiness using uh, uh, the multiple sleep latency test or the multiple uh, wakefulness maintenance of wakefulness test. And these are important uh, assessments in determining, uh, for instance, whether a patient is fit to drive, um, but also to understand what the patient is uh, doing in their home life. Coming into a laboratory is, is what I call hotelitis. If it's one night, it's a strange place. Uh, whereas trying to monitor patients in their own home uh, can be a lot uh, more interesting and more beneficial in some respects. It is also bringing together uh, local, national and international procedural and clinical guidelines. And for instance, a UK one in sleep breathing problems would be the recently published uh, NICE guidelines. 
but you need to be able to do blood gases because there are aspects of sleep medicine where being able to understand what uh, the PCO2 and the bicarbonate <clears throat> is will influence how we might manage and then treat those patients. And depending on those results, you may switch from CPAP to NIV, for instance. Again, it's applying very much a patient-centered approach to practice. Uh, communication is essential, going through the results uh, in which are often quite detailed and quite complex with patients is a key element because the patient needs to understand what their problems are. We need to make sure the patient does understand what their problems are, and then we can move forward with uh, applying a treatment plan, uh, whatever that actually is for that particular patient. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the respiratory sleep disorders, and this will predominantly focus on obstructive sleep apnea, which is the biggest component of that. But there are other aspects to sleep breathing problems. Uh, we know that people who, for instance, use opiates, depending on the level of opiates, will have abnormal breathing patterns, and it won't necessarily be obstructive apneas. It'll be more likely central. So actually knowing what the patient is on uh, in terms of uh, uh, official drug regimens, uh, uh, understanding how to investigate that and what is relevant to that, both from a simple viewpoint through to the more complex point, is uh, important. It is also important to appraise the effectiveness of treatments. And uh, certainly in sleep apnea, that was excellently covered in the recent NICE guidelines, um, whilst CPAP may be uh, the primary uh, outcome uh, treatment. Uh, there are a number of other treatments that NICE uh, looked at and recommended. So it's understanding what is appropriate for that patient uh, sitting in front of you. Uh, not everybody likes CPAP. And again, as the point seven says, it is very much about understanding and communicating uh, with the patient. And patients and family members and carers need to understand what is going on uh, and how we approach uh, the particular disorder uh, and what the benefits uh, are of various treatments. Next slide. And effectively, this is very much the same when we're dealing with non-respiratory uh, sleep disorders. So this is your narcoleptics, your insomniacs, uh, your idiopathic hypersomnolence, periodic leg movement syndrome, restless leg syndrome, etc. These are all more neurologically based disorders. However, it is important that by completing both the modules, a patient who is referred for sleep breathing problems can actually have more than one sleep disorder. So being aware of what is going on in terms of leg movements and how that is affecting sleep once you've treated uh, sleep breathing problems is very, very important. And this is what we see in our clinical practice in sleep medicine uh, almost every day. So it's looking at the different aspects of non-breathing problems. It's assessing those appropriately, working with uh, other sleep teams as we do in Bristol, um, we are Sleep Breathing Centre. Uh, we work very closely with our neuropsychiatric psychiatric group uh, at our other major hospital who are specialists in the uh, non-respiratory uh, disorders. And indeed, we uh, cross-manage patients and we refer patients in both directions. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, an outline of what we are proposing. Um, we are in the process of finalising this, so in the, in the coming uh, weeks we will have actually sorted this out and laid this in a tablet of stone. Uh, so we're proposing to have two block weeks to kick off uh, in October and the current dates are the 23rd and the 30th of October, and these will be on-campus blocks. We will then deliver online material uh, from a, a range of speakers um, between November and December, which will give us six weeks. And that will cover the two 10 credit blocks. There will be some assessments in uh, January uh, and February uh, in the, um, uh, the, the block weeks three and four. 
and then there will be some more online teaching uh, from February to March and then April to May um, as we have Easter in between uh, those two sessions. There'll be some final assessments uh, in June 2024, which will then conclude the academic component of the PG CERT. Throughout all of this, the uh, student will be expected to be in a laboratory, a sleep laboratory, uh, learning, getting skilled up uh, to, to meet the various requirements of the modules uh, so that they can complete uh, the whole thing with the underpinning theory, but also importantly, the huge amount of practical experience. And then in August 2024, uh, we will have finalised everything uh, and the certificate can be awarded. Uh, next slide, please. So we're in the process of putting together the course delivery team. Um, at the moment, the uh, individuals in the university hospitals have all agreed uh, that they are happy to be involved in the various aspects of teaching. And we're using a combination of clinical scientists, healthcare scientists, and uh, two of our consultant respiratory physicians uh, who are very keen to be involved in this. And also an orthodontist, because one of the treatments we use for uh, sleep apnea is, is a uh, mandibular advancement device. And Kate House is our local expert um, and works very closely with us on uh, many of our patients. Southmead Hospital with the Rosa Burden Centre, the RBC. At the moment, Dane Rainment, who's one of the consultant neuropsychiatrists, uh, is very happy to be involved. And one of the consultant neurophysiologists, uh, Nick Kane, has also expressed an interest in uh, being able to pay part of this course. We are approaching other members of the neuropsychiatric team at the Rosa Burden Centre uh, so that we can get a very broad range of experience from uh, the various practitioners within that team. And they will cover predominantly the uh, non-respiratory sleep disorders. We have approached a number of external uh, speakers uh, including some of the course team that put this curriculum together. So Megan Crawford um, has agreed to do an online lecture. She's actually based in Strathclyde. So popping down for a quick lecture is slightly more difficult. Uh, Professor York Steer has in principle said that he will be delighted to, 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 to provide online lectures. Uh, and he's currently president of the British Sleep Society. Sarah Parsons um, has agreed uh, to take part. Uh, she runs the St. George's Laboratory in London, Tim Quinnell. Um, I've actually yet to ask, but I'm expecting him to say yes. And Shruthri Konda has also uh, agreed in principle. So we have a good broad team of scientists um, uh, and uh, medical practitioners to deliver this course, uh, which we feel is uh, the best approach. And a, a number of the scientists have a lot of practical experience uh, in making these measurements, which is key uh, part of the course uh, delivery. Uh, next slide, please. So for those of you that don't know where UE is, um, it's just north of Bristol. Um, it's a campus university. And as you can see in the, in the map, uh, that's part of the University of the West of England. It has very good transportational links. Um, so coming into Bristol uh, is not, or going from the campus into Bristol and back is not that difficult. We have metro buses, which are rapid transport systems. And indeed M4 um, bus uh, picks up uh, at Bristol Parkway. So if any of the students are wishing to come down by train, please do not go to Bristol Temple Meads. Bristol Parkway is walkable. Temple Meads definitely isn't. Um, there's also Filton Abbey Wood, which is the other station that serves the, uh, the, the, the campus. We also have, uh, because we have our own bus station at UWE, um, you can also get a mega bus or a National Express coach uh, to the UWE campus, and they run fairly regularly. Um, the trains for uh, GWR and cross country. So basically anybody from Penzance going up to Birmingham, anybody from London Paddington to Swansea, they all stop at Bristol Parkway. 
uh, and above Birmingham, um, then they, they take various directions. So we are very well served by mainline train services. Uh, there's also Bristol Airport, which is quite a few miles south of Bristol, but has very good transportational links into the centre of Bristol and then linking into one of the metro buses up to the campus. Roads wise, um, the M5, the M4, uh, which leads on to the M32, provides transportation. Uh, and I, I know that one of my year two respiratory sleep uh, students actually regularly commutes on the block weeks daily um, uh, up to Warsaw. So we, we know that that works very well. In terms of accommodation, um, there's currently no accommodation on campus available. However, uh, two uh, very close hotels, the Holiday Inn and the Holiday Inn Express, both of which are walkable to the campus, uh, are available. And for those that prefer Premier Inn, um, they've built the, the ground floor. Uh, the rest of it will be built by the end of this uh, calendar year, one hopes, and therefore uh, that will provide a third uh, hotel within easy walking distance. Indeed, it's next to the Holiday Inn Express. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that's all I'm going to say. Um, these are just some amazing pictures of a very vibrant city called Bristol. So welcome to Bristol. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adrian. Um, does anyone have any questions specifically for Adrian about UE delivery of that academic element, or should we move over to the next speaker? Uh, okay. Um, so Liz, you've got your hand up if you want to ask your question. I have have put uh, the question in the chat but i was just wondering would there be any provision to uh, support centers that only deliver uh, pediatric sleep uh, and don't have much involvement in the ventilation side uh, so they're running msLTs and uh, polysomnography uh, for pediatrics that's a, a very good question um the postgraduate certificate as devised did not include um, paediatrics. Um, I think that would have to be an internal discussion, but um, I would express a personal opinion. Um, we have Bristol Children's Hospital right next to the sleep lab in the adult lab, um, and if it was permitted by the school uh, to allow us to include paediatrics, uh, I personally as a sleep specialist that works both in adults and to a lesser extent in paediatrics would not have a problem including it. But I think that needs um, other people to, to advise on that. Um, Thank you. We've got a, question, got a question from Gavin. Um, is the purpose of this to provide sleep only staff a route to a professional registration or provide expert training at master's level to registered staff or both? I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Um, it, the, the, the aim ultimately is to provide staff that are predominantly specialising in sleep medicine because we, we find it as a professional group difficult to get those staff um, and indeed the apprenticeship scheme, which you know, we, we deliver and it is excellent, it covers both respiratory and sleep. Um, and what we really need is sleep specialists. What it will lead to, I would hope that it would lead to professional recognition of professional bodies uh, and also uh, uh, sort of getting onto the HCPC uh, register ultimately, but I'm not quite sure how that would be achieved without going away and investigating it is the honest answer. I would hope so. Uh, thanks very much, Adrian. And um, we're going to hand over to Asad from Health Education to England. Um, so Adrian, if you want to remove yourself from the screen and Asad, if you add yourself in. I'm um, actually going to have to leave at this point because I'm actually in a conference. So I, I, I will be departing, I'm afraid. But thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for joining us, Adrian.
Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Asad Roachford, um, National Commissioning Manager um, at HEE. Um, one of the programmes I do help um, and assist um, is healthcare science. Um, and my work mainly revolves around the commissioning and the um, contract management and delivery of those. Um, so I haven't got any um, fancy slides like Anne-Marie and Adrian, um, so I'm just going to um, talk to you about the funding model um, that's coming um, with with these um, programmes. So just to mention, um, this is a fully funded programme, um, so that means that tuition fees will be covered and this will be paid directly to the universities um, once you've been accepted um, to take on um, to be part of the programme. Um, secondly, there's a one off training grant that's been um, that will be given. Um, this again will be um, this will be paid to the um, organisations or trusts um, by the regions. Um, the grant is expected to be a minimum of ten thousand um, pounds. We are expecting um, that this will increase, but we're just um, waiting for the confirmation of funding, which should arrive um, imminently. Um, the grant um, is like any other grant that you may have received from HEE. It's um, it can be used to contribute to um, cover re cover and reimburse costs incurred. Um, such as travel and accommodation for the students. Um, payment will um, consist of um, seven tenths and five twelfths um, over two payments for the for the um, over the year. Um, and like I said, it's a one off. And um, lastly, it can be used as a contribution um, for the creation of a role or um, to backfill um, a post. Um, so yeah, that's mainly it regarding the funding. There will be a lot more information that will be provided um, once we have those confirmed, um, but that is the um, essence of the funding um, that we will be bringing across. Don't know if there's any um, questions. Uh, thank you, Asad. If anyone's got any questions specifically for Asad about the funding, um, if you pop them into the Q&A tab, um, we will ask those. Just give a couple of minutes, see if anything comes in for you. Um, so there's a question in the chat um, that is the grant tax free? Yes, the grant is tax free. Um, all education funding is um, exempt from VAT. Any other questions or we'll move on? OK, um, so thank you, Asad. We're going to pass over to Helene now. Um, oh, wait, no, Asad, one question just come in. Is there still time for 2023 slash 2024 funding? Oh, you're on mute, Asad. Um, is there still time for 23-24 funding? Yes, this is for 23-24 activity. Um, so everything that we've discussed, the funding is for 23-24 and will be consistent um, for the, we hope for the you know duration of the programme um, going forward. Um, we've got a hand up. I'd like to ask a question. Sorry, I can't see. Soraya? Yeah, hi. Um, I just thought I would ask the question that it, it was in the previous chat, but I'm, I'm not sure it's been answered completely. Um, I'm a retired GP. I'm not in a work placement, but I've got a huge interest and have had a huge interest in sleep medicine for years. And, and I would really like to go down this route as a second career out of general practice. Am I not eligible if I've retired? Um, I'm not entirely sure on that. Um, I can take your query back um, and just confirm and, you know, I'd be happy to take your email address um, and then confirm back to you or um, I don't know if um, any other um, colleague may have um, an answer for this. I think Jane has. Um, 
Do you want me to chip in here? Um, yeah. So these um, uh, grants and positions are open to people who are in employment. So it's the employer who will be requesting the post on behalf of one of their trainees, because obviously we have to link the um, the uh, academic training with the uh, workplace training. So where departments have openings, people can be taken on and immediately put onto one of these programmes. But you'd need to have a, a, a backing employer to enable you to come onto one of these programmes through this particular scheme. It may be that you can access the academic training through the university directly, but to get the funding from um, HEE, you would need to be in an employer and the employer would receive the training grant. Okay, so could, could you, could the university actually give any guidance in terms of open posts that I, might be appropriate to my... I guess that's something that they would need to think about and develop. That's not something that's part of this particular programme. That would be kind of their business outside of this. So I can't advise on that one. OK, thank you. Um, Saad, we've got one last question from you, if you just want to pop back on. Um, so it's, is this grant applicable for the graduate diploma at Sheffield Hallam? Apologies, I may have missed this. Yes, it's for um, all of the um, um, programmes as part of the diagnostic workforce. Um, so it's eligible for the students at UWE and Sheffield Hallam. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Helene, if you'd like to come on screen and we'll move over to your section of the presentation. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Helen Fouquet. I'm Education Commissioning Manager for HE Southwest. I work closely with uh, both the National School and with ASAD. Um, so I have some slides on how to express interest in these funding grants. It's just one slide, which hopefully you see now. Is that on your screen? Yes, yes. It is. yes. Great. So um, the way we're going to uh, collect expressions of interest is through a national portal. So this portal is being developed at the moment. It will be open uh, in a week. The link to the portal will be sent uh, by regional healthcare science leads to their contact lists when the portal opens. If you are concerned that you may not be on that contact list, please do let us know. Uh, so you could put your uh, address in the chat, for instance, and then we can make sure that you are um, added to our contact list. We will review expressions of interest. Um, there is no limit to numbers of grants uh, individual employers may want to um, express an interest for. We'll have a national panel with regions represented uh, once we have the expressions of interest and if there is more demand than RHE funding or than um, the universities can accommodate, HE will seek to reach an allocation which is fair to all seven regions and uh, which if it's within a region is fair within that region so uh, looking at different ICBs. The timelines are on the screen so the portal will open on 20th of March. You'll have five weeks to put your expressions of interest into it. Um, the evaluation panel will take place week beginning 3rd of May and we'll have clarifications as soon as possible afterwards and we are hoping that the outcomes will be communicated to you by uh, the end of May. Now I and I one thing that I want to clarify is that these are funding related it does not actually um, um, you still need to apply to the university and the university still needs to accept you or rather your trainee on to the course. So the, this is to do with the funding rather than admissions criteria. So that was uh, a short summary of what the, uh, the system is going to be. I'll stop sharing now. 
Uh, thanks very much, Elaine. Um, does anyone have any questions about the expression of interest process um, specifically for Helene to answer? Um, there's a couple of people who've put something into the chat about added, being added to the list. Um, Nick, you've got a question? Um, not, so, uh, not so much a question, but um, a suggestion that because you, you, the emphasis was very much on um, regional leads and Helene, um, and the request will be can it also be pushed out through the national school via their newsletters as well, please. Yeah, I can no, definitely do idea. that, Nick. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've got some people wanting to be added to the list in the chat. Um, any questions specifically for Helene um, before we open it up to questions for all the presenters? Uh, no, okay, so if, I, if all the presenters could come back on, um, we have a question for you, Anne-Marie, about Hallam. Um, so for the PG dip at Hallam, if employers were able to fund and support a master's research project, would it be possible to combine academic credits for a full master's? Um, right, the graduate diploma is not level seven. Um, so this this is um th these are level six modules so it wouldn't be part of a master's program so i think the answer to that is probably no um really uh. um will the pg dip graduates be registrable at the end I believe so. I believe that the curriculum has been designed such that that's possible, but I saw, saw Jane nodding there as yeah, well. I no, believe that's the case, just, isn't it? Just clarifying um, a little it, bit that the, the graduate diploma, which is the respiratory uh, uh, science one, is aligned to the PTP outcomes. So the um, graduate diploma that Anne-Marie is going to be um, organising at Sheffield will take um, students that have got different degrees to the same level as a PTP trainee. We've been talking to the academy so that they can um, automatically get uh, registration as um, not the statutory registration, the accredited registration, which is the same level that practitioners get at the end of that. And we think that's going to go through. We've still got a couple of things to sign off on that one, but that's looking like they will automatically be able to get onto the same register that PTP graduates would get onto. And um, just got a quick question. Can I check my understanding? The PG dip is level six education, and the PG cert in sleep is level seven education. Yes, but um, it's not a P. It's, it's not, not a PG, PG dip. dip. It's a graduate diploma, not a postgraduate diploma in respiratory science. Um, and then, what are the entry requirements for the PG cert in sleep? I can answer that one. So we think they're going to be the same so at the end of the day it's up to the university who they um, admit but it looks like the same kind of thing so that it would be a first or a two one in um, uh, an appropriate um, background so that would include a physiology it would include anything that's related to that healthcare sciences so nursing degrees radiography degrees forensic science medicine anybody who's got that kind of for the postgraduate one they need to have a first or a two one or a very exceptional universities may be able to accept a two two with some some um, experience in in the area but that will be based on the university's uh, requirements at a postgraduate level for the pg cert um, is there a minimum number of hours a staff member should work for the graduate diploma As in, do you, are you mean in the terms of their employment contract in their workplace? Is is that what we're? I think so, that's what it means. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I'd have to check myself whether that's specified somewhere in the documentation. But my, um, certainly for the apprenticeship, we're looking at thirty out thirty hours per um, week. Is is I think what's kind of like acceptable to be to be able to do the full apprenticeship in in three years, and this this um this is actually perhaps a little bit higher workload than just one of those years, um. 
we would be looking at 30 hours per week in employment. Most of our apprentices have normally been in full time employment. I I think and, and, and maybe it's something I'll need to go away and, and check and, and discuss with the, the team from HE as well. But um, my, my feeling is that to complete the course in that in the one year time with, on, on less than that number of hours would perhaps be um, a bit too much of an ask for that that individual to complete what's required in the workplace in terms of the practical training as well as engage with the um, the academic side of things as well um i, I mean I, if if there, if there are no um specified hours required then then obviously we, we'd be happy to sort of discuss that with a, with an employer but I, th I think we'd need to make sure that that it was doable in the work time of, of any given individual uh, really if that does that kind of answer the question as much as I can at the moment, I think. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. so we've got another question. What professional registration will those completing the PG cert in sleep be able to have upon completion? Um, so a lot of the people who complete the PG cert will already have um, statutory registration. So if they come from a, a nursing or an allied health professionals background or a medical background, they already have statutory registration. For those who are um, completing it as healthcare scientists, they may already be at that level, they may already be clinical scientists. If not, then we would expect the PG cert in the same way that the ECHO training programme does, it adds a lot to a portfolio towards um, equivalence for the STP. So it doesn't lead directly to um, statutory registration for a healthcare scientist because that's at a different level to um, nurses. Nursing comes in at a, a post uh, BSc level, they get their statutory registration, whereas for, for clinical scientists, it's a postgraduate um, level. So the PG cert leads to a PG cert. It doesn't lead to registration, but it's um, very useful evidence to put towards your portfolio. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question is from Tracy. Are students with a foundation degree accepted on the respiratory diploma? I think we have that down as a BSc honours. Uh, yeah, I believe it's BSc honours. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, from Dawn Marie, uh, the question is, will we be sent information on how to apply to the university? So I think we have, um, uh, Helene has got a, a pack that she's been working on that's going to be um, a lot of information to, for employers um, summarising all of this. That's going to be ready as soon as we've got the final details on what the actual funding will be, because as, as I'd mentioned, it's going to be around about 10,000. It might be slightly more depending on uh, various conversations that are happening outside of our control. Um, but within that, it will explain how to apply to the, the course um, and we will coordinate once we get those applications from um, HE, once they've gone through the portal. At that stage, uh, we will be communicating with the universities and making sure that um, the appropriate qualifications are there for people. So it'll be up to the universities at that point to check the qualifications and make sure that people are appropriate. Um, another question we've got is, when can we start applying for the PG cert? Elaine? So uh, my bit really is about the funding. So uh, the, the the date, the portal of exp for expressions of interest opens on the 20th of March and um, you, you'll have an outcome at the end of May. So this is the point at which uh, you can contact the universities and um, go through their own recruitment um, to, to the procedure. Yeah, so you need to find out if you've got um, the funding first and then at that point we will help coordinate um, with the universities um, that kind of application process with them. OK, uh, the next question is from Nicola. Is the PG cert aimed at a particular NHS banding, i.e. band five or six? PG cert uh, needs to be somebody who's got um, that underpinning level of knowledge. So um, we would expect them to be at a level that they can be accepted onto a PG cert. So that's not likely to be a level five. I think it's probably like, likely to be a bit higher than that. Um, so that follows on to a question from Joanne. 
Um, we plan to employ at band four level whilst training and then move to band five when qualified. Does that sound right? And that's for the dip. And um, if I think that sounds probably OK, that's um, kind of the, what we're thinking of this is it's at the level of the practitioner. So uh, somebody who's post PG, PTP is likely to come in at a band five, I understand. So that that sounds the same kind of level, doesn't it? I think that's right. Well, um, we've got no more questions in the Q&A tab. Um, so I'll just give uh, it a minute for any other questions to come through. And if not, um, we will bring the webinar to an end. Um, so we'll just take a minute. Oh, Graham, we've got a question from you. Uh, uh, thanks, Katie. Uh, great presentations, guys. Just just a little bit concerned that you may not have fully answered the question on the foundation degree. Yeah, no, that, that was a no. It was a, it needs it to was be a, a no, was it? degree, a BSc, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah sorry, I, I just wanted to check that. <laughs> okay, yeah, that, 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 that's what I intended to come over if, yeah. if it didn't come over, sorry. But yes, that was what was OK, said. thanks. Great. OK, um, we've not had any more questions come in. Um, so, Jane, if I hand back to you um, to just close the webinar. OK, so thank you all for, for listening and for your questions. Thank you for the presenters as well. Um, we recognise that a lot of people may be watching this uh, on the webinar as well, so you probably have more questions. So please um, send those in. They can come to the National School if you want to send them to us, um, but kind of make your title quite clear so that the people on uh, the, the inbox know where to send it. You can also ask um, questions of the universities and of um, Helene, uh, but it, it may be easier to send them to school so that we can coordinate those for you. Um, and as I say, uh, Helene's been working on a, a document that will come out at some point over the next week. So we'll, we'll ensure that that's available on our website and then we'll send it to our contacts um, on the list so that you have all that information there. And the portal is due to open next week, Helene, is that right? That's right. Yeah. OK, so please feel free to ask questions if you've got them, you know, just send them along to the school and they'll direct them on to me and I'll, I'll make sure that they get answered. But thank you very much.